So good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on inclusive recruitment and uh, beyond. Um, some of you will have attended our uh, breakfast event, uh, which we hosted on the 21st of February, uh, which was off the same uh, subject. Um, today's session is, uh, is two things, really. One is it's a recap. Uh, of some of the kind of core messages from the breakfast event and also it's an opportunity for anyone who didn't attend uh, to kind of uh, hear some of the kind of uh, key messages um, in relation to how we promote um, uh, both um, inclusive recruitment processes but also how we work to create an environment which is uh, inclusive uh, also. So in terms of the agenda for the webinar, uh, we'll do a very brief refresh in terms of why we're we talking about principles of inclusivity and essentially what gets in the way. And that's some of the biases uh, that we know play out uh, in the recruitment process uh, and beyond. And then we'll take you through the key stages of promoting inclusive recruitment. And that's everything from uh, job design, um, how we advertise and where we advertise our roles, candidate um, attraction search, shortlisting, uh, interviewing, and then the debriefing. So that will essentially be uh, stage one uh, of the session. And then once we've kind of looked at each of those stages in a bit of detail, uh, we'll pause and then move on to part two, which will be promoting inclusive work cultures. And what we want to do there is draw on some of the research from Iris Bonet, from her work from Harvard University and some other studies which have really demonstrated what best practice looks like in terms of moving just from the principle of diversity to organisational inclusivity. So simply starting with the basics, we're all these days I think relatively familiar with the concept of unconscious bias. This quote from Daniel Kahneman I suppose sums up for me um, how bias really plays out and the extent to which bias has an impact in terms of organisational decision making. And actually what Daniel Kahneman you can see says is we're blind to our own blindness. We have very little idea of how little we know. We're not even designed to know how little we know. And what his research has shown and, and other work from behavioural psychologists and social psychologists is that human beings essentially have a default position. And that is we are, we're really designed to gravitate towards people who are like us, people that look like us and sound like us and think like us and come from similar backgrounds to us. And this gravitation towards similarity plays out in a number of ways. And one of the ways in which it plays out is through our hiring process. So and now I want to move on to take you through, well, what are the different types of biases which impact recruitment and what are the things that we can do to mitigate them? And that's the idea of promoting inclusive recruitment. So let's start with the first stage, job design. Uh, the key biases which I'd encourage you to watch out for here in the job design process. The first is affinity bias and as a definition um, affinity bias is the tendency to hire people who are like us. It's often called the mini-me effect and affinity bias plays out um, essentially when we're hiring people who are similar to us and that's culture, background, personality etc. An example of this would be um, hiring managers are likely to hire a candidate who graduated from the same university as they did or a candidate who has worked perhaps in a, a sector that they're familiar with and have positive associations uh, of that sector. Um, so that's essentially the idea of, of affinity bias. And of course, that principle applies to lots of other areas. The other interesting phenomena, which is not technically a cognitive or social bias, is something which we call stereotype threat. And stereotype threat occurs when an individual is at risk of confirming negative stereotypes about their own group and this thus be judged based on group membership as opposed to being based on their individual merit. So let's think of a practical example. Um, a black candidate is more likely to be aware of their social identity um, in an interview situation where the interview panel is all white. Um, 
So that's about candidates being aware of their own identity when information um, exaggerates that phenomenon. And that can play out in job design as well as that example in terms of interview. So things to watch out for there. What can we do? Uh, first of all, uh, making sure that we have monitoring systems in place. So have you monitored your employee demographics to identify any areas of underrepresentation? Uh, those areas of underrepresentation clearly help us to identify where gaps are uh, in our uh, organization. And therefore, we can make sure that we are um, uh, designing jobs which are targeted towards particular groups. And therefore, we can uh, put in some language uh, which we know encourages certain groups to apply. Um, and um, the second point is to review the job description and person specification for biased language. So we can take out words or phrases uh, which we know have a negative impact on whether it's women, disabled candidates, uh, other candidates, etc. There are some tools um, on the marketplace, some um, artificial intelligence tools, which are designed to help us to, uh, or assist us, to de-bias um, um, job descriptions in person specifications. Tools like Textio uh, is a fairly common tool, relatively uh, cost effective actually also. So I would encourage organizations to perhaps um, think about using the Textio uh, license to assist you to, to do that. Uh, also think about uh, is this a role which is overwhelmingly occupied by a particular group. Um, Psychobabble talks about something called the representative heuristic and what that means is uh, when we have a job which is overwhelmingly populated by a particular group. So if we think of some examples, so maybe even if we think of construction work which is overwhelmingly populated by men as opposed to women. Uh, we know that that's much more likely to encourage men to apply, but conversely, it's much more likely to discourage women from applying. So it's about being mindful of that and how we can message our job design so that we mitigate some of those perceptions and some of those biases there. This would clearly follow through in terms of how we advertise uh, roles. Again, affinity bias would play out in terms of advertising. And that would be everything from the words that we use, but also think about the images, you know, some of the very basic things, the images we use, the phraseology we use in our advertising campaigns. Uh, they would they would either send a positive signal to some group or a negative signal to others. Uh, but in addition to things like affinity bias, we also encountered what's called gender benevolence uh, within that job um, advert process. And gender benevolence is a tendency to make assumptions and decisions about women which appear positive but in practice damage women's careers. Actually, we can apply the principle of benevolence to things like um, age. So we make uh, assumptions about people, whether they're younger or older. And benevolence is also shown to have quite um, an impact in relation to disability. Uh, so one example might be um, um, male and sometimes female managers may not assign um, a global project with extensive travel to a female colleague who has recently come from maternity leave, assuming she would wish to, wish, she would not wish to be away from her children. Um, so the, you can see that the intention is positive, but the outcome can be quite negative. So things to think about in terms of the job uh, advert, do the, does the recruitment material depict a wide range of social groups? Um, have you um, stated uh, explicitly your commitment to, for instance, things like flexible or agile working? And if you also expressly stated your commitment to hiring diverse candidates? Um, the usual thing that we see in um, job adverts is that phrase, which is we are an equal opportunities employer. That's become so standard, it's almost redundant in terms of the impact that it has uh, on a candidate's um, a motivation to uh, apply for a role. It's, it's kind of a, a quite a, a blanket and almost really bland uh, statement actually. So I think we need to be a bit more specific and say, uh, you know, as company X, we actively see people from BME groups, we actively see disabled candidates, LGBT candidates, etc. And actually you can even be a bit clever, you can have two sentences. So based on our analysis of where we are, we actively welcome applications from 
uh, that's probably likely to have much more impact than that statement of we are an equal opportunities employer. Then when we move into the attraction and search, of course, the, the, the uh, uh, advert plays a key part in that and those images and the rest of it. Uh, but the things to be mindful of in terms of the attraction and search, uh, first of all, things to watch out for in terms of group think. So as a reminder in terms of the definition, so group think basically occurs, you know, when hiring managers make faulty decisions because of the group's pressure for conformity, and that prevents really kind of discussions of alternative avenues um, and actually um, managers are, are especially vulnerable to group think uh, when its members are from similar backgrounds um, and, you know when the group's isolated from outside opinion so it's really important to think about um, who's in the decision making process um, from you know constructing our jobs to the advert and then in terms of the search process uh, but an example of this is, you know, a group of hiring managers are less likely to challenge each other's views on a particular candidate when they all look and sound and think the same, actually, um, and if they're not following a debiting checklist. So that's one thing, but then obviously source bias is a particular uh, issue when we're thinking about traction and search, and source bias is the tendency to add greater weight to information from a source that we're familiar with. And of course, these days, a lot of our um, attraction searches from our network. And if, on one level, that makes sense because we, our network is made up of people that we trust and people we respect, whose who's, who's opinions we welcome. Uh, we often use uh, LinkedIn and other sources. So in many ways, our network is quite valuable. But of course, there are some risks to that also. Um, you know, clearly an example of source bias would be we might seek a second opinion um, of a candidate from a colleague whose opinion we value. And again, that makes sense sometimes, but the problem is uh, we're more likely to value the opinion of colleagues who are essentially in our in-group. So it falls into back to affinity bias and back to uh, in-group bias uh, as well. So things to watch out for there and the things that you can do. So, you know, have you explicitly uh, set out your expectations uh, internally uh, on diverse shortlistings um, and set diversity targets? Have you communicated those to your uh, external support agencies, your recruitment agencies, uh, executive search companies, etc.? So is there clarity in terms of what you expect from shortlisting processes? And again, if, are you working in partnership with specialist organizations to help you find the candidates? One of the messages we hear is, well, we can't find the diverse candidates or they're just not there. Um, that's not something I buy into, actually. I think um, uh, if we're much more proactive by working with specialist agencies like Ray Recruitment, uh, you know, and other organizations, um, you know, we can find diverse candidates that help us to, to focus down. Uh, covering issues like disability, um, um, uh, ethnicity and race, uh, gender, uh, sexual orientation, etc. So we don't have to do things alone, actually. Um, you know, partnership working is key in terms of all sorts of areas these days, and the principle applies to uh, recruitment. Um, and have you reviewed your website and other uh, application processes to ensure they're fully accessible, actually, uh, because accessibility is key. Uh, to do that. We at the CEDA have an um, extremely accessible website and, and our research has shown that um, accessible websites and other um, material do have a, a positive impact in terms of who applies and obviously uh, the negative is who doesn't apply. So that's in terms of candidate attraction and search. Moving on to shortlisting. Again, we see the affinity bias playing out. Uh, so you can see that affinity bias is a theme which goes through the whole process, really. But another type of bias, and this is quite a major bias, actually, which creeps then uh, shortlisting, is confirmation bias. And that's essentially the tendency to look for or interpret information which it confirms existing thoughts, beliefs, assumptions, perceptions, etc. Um, an example of confirmation bias could be, you know, a first impression of a candidate may be formed by reading a CV or an application form. And then at the interview, panel members will often ask questions 
which are really designed to confirm those first impressions. And those first impressions could be negative or they could be positive. But we start skewing um, the, uh, the shortlisting and interview processes uh, to find evidence which matches our expectations. One of the ways to mitigate bias here is clearly around uh, introducing blind decision making. And that's the notion where we take irrelevant information off um, applications. It's, it's easier to do on an application than it is on a CV because on an application form, you can have a front sheet which covers somebody's name, obviously their address and other details such as university they went to, hobbies, interests and all that stuff which might interfere with making objective decisions. And that can be taken off and then hiring managers can have a second sheet and third sheet which covers their skills and experiences which align to competences. Um, slightly more tricky to do in relation to CVs, although um, some managers can be creative around that and sort of trying to blank out information, although clearly it's much more difficult to do. Uh, so if you can move towards an application process, um, I think you'd get more fruits there in terms of blind decision making and the outcomes of that. Um, and then have you involved a range of diverse stakeholders when reviewing uh, applications? I mean, that goes back to some of those principles around um, group think essentially. Obviously, if we have um, similar types of people who are reviewing um, applications, uh, there's not much room for debate or critical thinking. So that could be a risk there. And then again, using specialist AI programs to screen out bias in your shortlisting uh, processes, um, that would be quite useful as well. So moving on to uh, interviewing, uh, we start to see some of these biases really um, working together. So again, we've got affinity bias and confirmation bias, and those sorts of biases, uh, even though here they're bulleted, um, they actually start to work in tandem and they and they start to collude with each other. Uh, so that sort of exaggerates exaggerates uh, the effect and the outcome. Another thing to watch out for is the halo or the horns effect. And this is essentially, this occurs when um, we find one attribute uh, particularly attractive about a candidate, but then that one attribute which we find attractive, I suppose starts to colour our views of the candidate's total skills and competences. Um, so an example here would be, if a candidate dresses smartly, we may assume, if we value this, uh, that they will put together well-presented client presentations. So we're making um, uh, this linkage between appearance and uh, presentations, which is a competency. Uh, so we need to be mindful of that. Uh, that's the halo effect. The horns effect is the opposite of that. So if a candidate um, uh, does something or has an attribute which we uh, find less attractive, we might generalize across the competences. So, Things that we can do at the interview, um, is the interview panel uh, visibly diverse? That would mitigate against um, stereotype threat. Um, and that's quite an important um, um, thing to do because actually we know that stereotype threat actually does have quite a particular effect on the, the performance at interview of minority candidates. Um, so if we want to create a, a level playing field, uh, we really need to consider um, what, the, what the panel looks like. Um, moving to system decision making, uh, do use group interview processes and making sure that the process and the interview follows a preset of questions. So this is not meant to be overly prescriptive and it's not meant for the interview to be robotic. Um, you know, we still want the interview to be human and we want the interview to be probing. But the more that we can follow a set of questions and um, you know, follow those questions in a particular order and then also have some um, an effective scoring system uh, which anchors um, the skills and competences that we're looking for in the interview, there's less opportunity for us to go off script and there's therefore less opportunity for bias to creep into that process. So using a scoring system and then aggregating scores uh, 
um, before the debriefing will have um, a specific mitigation effect um, at that interview. And then finally, really, just in terms of the debriefing um, itself, um, you know, people talk quite a lot about organisational fit. So will this candidate fit in? Are they, you know, an X type? Well, you know, cohesion uh, in organisations is clearly um, something that we're after because there is some interesting work around how cohesion uh, can make organizations to a certain extent more effective more efficient and more productive but we don't want to we don't want to disguise organizational fit or, or rather we don't want to disguise affinity bias for organizational fit so i think we need to be um transparent and mindful in terms of what does that really mean um and if we're trying to hire diverse candidates to what extent are conversations around fit working against our strategic objectives? So particularly pay attention to that. And then decision fatigue uh, is the final thing to pay attention to, which is this really occurs when our kind of cognitive resources, essentially our mental energy and our willpower become depleted uh, due to a succession of decisions. So for example, after a, a full day, having a full day of interviews, uh, interviewers will be prone to less energy, less willpower, therefore decision fatigue late in the afternoon. And that's going to kind of have um, some kind of impact on their ability to judge a candidate objectively. Uh, so the simple thing there is, you know, try not to interview on a Friday afternoon when everyone's thinking about going home for the weekend, much more likely to be tired. And, um, and actually the, the, the candidate that's interviewed when we're fresh and alive on Tuesday morning, is, is going to be is going to have a better ride so things to watch out for in that debriefing are you monitoring and tracking uh data targets so are you monitoring and tracking in fact this principle applies all the way through the processes so in terms of monitoring and tracking data we should be monitoring on all the protected characteristics and are we um tracking who's applying for jobs are we tracking um who's being shortlisted uh, are we tracking who's getting through to interview and are we tracking who's being ultimately appointed? And that process allows us to identify um, a bias within those particular decision points. So we might find that we're doing quite well in terms of attracting our target candidates um, in the first place, but maybe some of them are falling down through the shortlisting process, or they might be relatively okay through shortlisting, and some others are falling down either at interview or at the debriefing. So that can help us to put a spotlight or pay attention to a specific area there. And then do you find yourself uh, or a colleague pushing for one particular candidate with an average score? So if we have one candidate that's got an average score, you know, candidate A has an average score, but candidate B has a, even well, either an average score or a score which is slightly higher, why do we find ourselves pushing for a particular candidate? Now, we might not use the language, but there's something in there possibly around the affinity which we just like that candidate we just think they'll fit in and do well here so when we're using that sort of language we need to ask ourselves what is it about them and is there some kind of likability um, and the whole point of using a scoring system is that we can make our decisions uh, really based on um, um, merit as opposed to the likability and the final thing is uh, probably introduce some kind of, we would recommend introducing some kind of devil's advocate into the process. And that's really having somebody on the interview panel or at the debriefing whose role is to challenge you, you know, to ask those, um, those critical questions. Why are we pushing for certain candidates? Why are we not pushing for other candidates? Um, why is it that we see patterns in that we're pushing for uh, certain candidates, perhaps, um, and we can connect that to um, some of their uh, protected characteristics or other uh, personality traits and things like that. Um, so the devil's advocate is a useful mechanism just to keep sure we're on track and constantly going back to uh, evidence and asking for evidence in terms of why we are um, keen to reject one uh, or push for the other. These principles are pretty much based on um, what we know works in terms of bias mitigation and what we also know 
is that if we follow a system which is um, uh, process driven and we follow some kind of checklist and methodology for recruiting, um, bias is less, far less likely actually uh, to creep into that process. And so we're much more likely to mitigate bias and therefore we are much more likely uh, to see diverse candidates coming through um, ultimately to um, appointment. So that's the first principle or the first set of principles around uh, promoting inclusive recruitment. Um, now what's interesting around this uh, conversation is moving towards the principles of organisational inclusivity because even though some organisations have done quite well in terms of candidate attraction and appointment, actually what we find is they, they're therefore um, asked to work within an organisational environment which encourages um, people to conform to organisational norms. So that starts to drown um, the diversity but also the inclusivity um, out of that process. So this is the second uh, principle we need to focus on. So a couple of things that we can look at in terms of promoting inclusive work cultures. One is again around the people analytics and that sort of follows through really kind of some of the themes in terms of are we sort of uh, you know using data effectively. Um, so do we collect, track, analyze data to identify trends and patterns covering a wide range of decision areas? So this is everything from the hiring we've just talked about but once we're in an organization you know uh, project allocation, uh, what are the, who are the types of people that get the exciting projects, the stretching projects, the global projects, those projects with high visibility, uh, can we track that? Now it's easy relatively to track that based on characteristics such as gender and ethnicity. Of course it's much more difficult to track that based on even some invisible identities based on um, a personality and thinking style in introverts and extroverts. But the more that we can try and have some kind of mechanisms um, we can start to identify those trends and patterns and the point of that is in order to correct uh, any imbalances there. The second is even trying to track informal stuff, so micro behaviours. Uh, who do senior managers have spend their time with? Uh, who do they have lunch with? Who do they have coffee with? Um, who do they have uh, you know, drinks with after work? So of course it's, it's, uh, it's not easy to have a system around that uh, but even some kind of um, process like having a diary to monitor that in an informal way would be useful. That principle would apply with time with clients and then things like time in one-to-ones. So does everybody get the same amount of time in one-to-ones or do some people get half an hour, some people get 45 minutes. That extra 50 minutes can be quite critical in terms of somebody's um, career opportunities. So the simple answer is really, or the simple message is really about tracking but the point here is not about tracking, the point is about tracking and analysing in order that we can correct any uh, negative trends that we identify there. Uh, principle two is really about changing the default position by making agile working the norm. So just in terms of a definition, um, agile working is really about the notion of anytime, anywhere. So utilising technology uh, such as mobile phones, um, laptop computers, etc. Um, um, and we and with agile working we're really moving away from a situation of time-based performance which is um, working nine to five and location-based performance which is in an office so it's now moving away from monitoring are you in the office nine to five to monitoring performance so you can work in different locations using technology but we're actually now going to measure outcomes what are you actually doing now, just to be clear, I am not advocating a free-for-all and I'm definitely not advocating everybody works agile all the time because it's important to have people in a team and connecting together. But it's about flexing it up when we need it, but making agile working part of the wider company culture. Um, I have come to the conclusion that um, current models of part-time working, flexible working, um, I would even go so far to say that they don't actually work actually but, but what they do do is they create neurological networks which suggest that when we think about part-time working we automatically have a neuro neurological um, association of women 
disabled um, employees, etc. And that just falls back into an assumption of uh, what women want and expect from an employer. I think that's far too simplistic in terms of the modern world. So moving away from traditional notions of fle flexible working to this notion of agile working, and then repositioning the debate. This is not this is not a debate about women or minorities. This is a debate, a debate about talent. So encouraging men and other leaders to, as they say uh, in PepsiCo Australia, and using to leave loudly to make it much more visible that this is a this is a leadership thing. It's for men as well as uh, women. The next one is really around role models, actually, and there's lots of research around the extent to which role models do actually matter. Um, you know, when you're in an organization and you look up the organizational pipeline, if you see people that look like you and sound like you and behave like you and come from similar backgrounds, it sends a subtle message that people like you can make it in this organization. And obviously, if you don't see that, it sends a completely different message. So. Essentially, the more we become exposed to senior women, black and minority ethnic groups, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender leaders, the more we expect to see these populations as, as leaders. And therefore, it normalizes the fact that these groups, of course, can become and should become organizational leaders. The very simple things that we can do, you know, the amount of times that I go into corporate cultures virtually every day and see portraits hanging through the corridors of old white men in you know old-fashioned suits you know these things are just completely outmoded uh, images in terms of the modern world but they do send a message so flexing up and diversifying portraits uh, to have diverse role models in meeting rooms in recruitment campaigns and annual reports and extending that principle to uh, you know, speakers at town hall events, but also when we have, um, when we're doing conferences and we've got panels, making sure that our panels are not made up of all white men or just all one particular group, really diversifying that in terms of ethnicity, gender, disability, um, etc. Really just send quite a powerful signal uh, psychologically. Uh, group norms and what this means by group norms is really uh, consciously working towards promoting diversity in things like team meetings on client projects at client pitches uh, etc so diversity just becomes part of normal behavior and normal decision making processes um, a couple of things to draw out in particular one is about how we vis um, um, make diversity much more visible uh, using the principle of amplification um, amplification is something which was uh, essentially developed at the White House under Barack Obama and it's really that kind of classic thing where uh, you know women were in team meetings and made a suggestion but the suggestion wasn't really picked up and a guy would say and uh, you know it's that old thing uh, you know that's amazing uh, so what we need to do is um, amplify the voices of women and other groups when they make amazing ideas so having uh, other colleagues in that meeting room jumping on that good idea so not any idea but the good idea and saying we support that let's move it forward follow through on that so post meeting sending emails to amplify the voice of the person in the meeting that made the suggestion so they're really getting the credibility and then questioning so you know we talked previously in the role models around uh, conference panels so questioning um, all male conference panels, all male um, client teams, speaking opportunities, etc. Now, of course, this doesn't only apply to gender, it absolutely applies to ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, age, a whole range of those visible and invisible um, characteristics. And then the final principle really in terms of promoting um, inclusive organizations is increasing transparency in decision making. Um, sharing information on inclusion at work does increase transparency. And um, once we have transparency in process, we have accountability in the process. And once we have accountability in the process, that is likely to affect our behaviors as well as our decision making processes. Um, so for example, um, 
introduce a range of targets and KPIs. Um, I work with the principle of what gets measured gets done. Now, I do not advocate um, introducing diversity quotas. Um, so when I talk about KPIs and targets, um, I'm talking about um, measures that we can put into place to move the agenda forward, as opposed to a quota which, um, to a certain extent, is simply a sticking plaster to some of the structural issues which get in the way. So we'd like to see KPIs and targets on around um, recruitment, but around work allocation, around sponsorship, you know, informal time with uh, clients and things like that. So this really starts to develop a system where we're developing everybody. So when those opportunities come up, that everybody uh, has the right skills and competences and they're not at disadvantage through the system itself. So KPIs around those sorts of things, um, absolutely. And then um, embedding that in um, completely throughout the organization. So asking um, department heads to publish data on diversity in their own department. So how are they doing on recruitment? How are they doing on retention, promotion, etc.? And having them report that up. So department heads, once they know that they're having to have some accountability itself, so the accountability is not just strategic and at the top of the organization that we move accountability and transparency down the organization and throughout, uh, that's more likely to um, affect those decisions of departments, heads and um, local managers. There has to be some kind of consequence if we set a bunch of targets and uh, they're um, either ignored or completely not met um, without some kind of uh, consequence around that. There will be no motivation um, for department heads or others to work towards them. So building uh, diversity KPIs into management um, um, sort of uh, goals and targets and yearly um, performance metrics is something that we would um, advocate. And then they have individual accountability uh, themselves and that can be brought up in their own one-to-ones and things like that. So the principle here is around working towards inclusive recruitment but we know that um, businesses only get those rewards of things like the reduction in groupthink, uh, innovation, creativity, customer insights, et cetera, if we have an environment which is inclusive as well. So we've got these dual strategies of ramping up our levels of diversity and ramping up our levels of organizational inclusivity. So these principles are based on what the evidence tells us uh, works. Um, we will be um, sending out a, uh, an insight paper which summarizes uh, some of these um, uh, principles and recommendations. Uh, so watch out for that. And that will contain some more uh, examples and um, a bit more detail actually uh, of some of the things that we've covered uh, just in this uh, short um, uh, WebEx session. Um, but thank you all uh, very much. Um, if you have any further thoughts, you can contact me uh, directly. Uh, my details are there. Or please do contact Investigo as your strategic partner. Um, Investigo are making some real kind of um, strides in this area, uh, are absolutely committed to this and clearly um, have some uh, further expertise addition. So please either contact myself or your um, client manager Investigo. Um, thank you all very much for uh, listening in and um, participating.